The theme of our inaugural Bank Assurance webinar today is managing risks that keep CEOs up at night. Our hope is that today's session will provide practical insights that you can take away and apply at your respective organization. I would like to express a profound gratitude to you for honoring our invitation to participate in this Maiden Bank Assurance webinar. The event will run for an hour, 30 minutes, starting with a welcome address by the Managing Director of Access Bank PLC, Dr. Herbert Wigwe, as the, and the Chairman, Board of Directors of Coronation Insurance PLC, Mr. Motiu Sumono. We will then proceed to the dialogues for the day. The first session will be a discussion on top macroeconomic risks that could impact your business, and this will be anchored by the renowned macroeconomist, Bode Augusto. Next, we'll have Nico Conradi, the managing director of, of Munich Re. He will take us through the second session, and he will speak to us on the growing relevance of cyber risks in today's business world and frameworks that we can put in place to safeguard our organizations. Our third and final keynote session for the day will be led by Simon Norris. Simon is a legal partner at Trinity International, a prestigious law firm in London. He will lead the discourse on project completion risk offering insights on long-term business planning and strategies for ensuring completion of critical business projects. The presentation session will be followed by a 15 minutes question and answer session, during which our keynote speakers will respond to questions from the audience. Without further ado, I would like to welcome the Group Managing Director and CEO of Access Bank PLC, Dr. Herbert Wigwe, for his welcome address. Please welcome Dr. Wigwe. My name is Herbert Wigwe, and I'm the Group Managing Director, uh, CEO of Access Bank PLC. On behalf of Access Bank and Coronation Insurance, I'd like to thank you for honoring our invitation and taking our time from your very busy schedules to attend this webinar event. There are several of them happening uh, these days, and it would appear that COVID, rather than making things slow down, is making people glued up to their screens in several different webinars. But I hope that today's webinar will be interesting given the topic uh, which is managing risks that keep ceos up at night um, i do have problems sleeping given all the problems that are happening i do hope that um, you know today's session will provide some solutions it will never provide but at least we will be in good company and all of us will be able to come up with different ways of, of being able to manage it today's event is of extreme significance of course to access bank and and of course i've had the privilege of actually calling and sending out invites uh, to several, several friends and customers because of how important uh, this particular webinar is. Coronation Insurance, which is formerly known as WAPIC Insurance, was a part of the Access Bank ecosystem. And we do have fond memories of the spin-off um, when our shareholders received their dividends after that particular um, uh, spin-off. And I'm very, very proud of the great strides that the institution has made since after the spin-off. Uh, recording several achievements, one of which has been the fastest growing corporate risk underwriter over the last decade. Coronation Insurance is also one of the top three most capitalized insurance organizations in Nigeria. In pursuit of our goal of being more than a bank to you, our esteemed customers, it has come to our notice that the largest banks across the globe with similar ambitions as ours have bank assurance partners who extend their suite of financial services obtainable directly or indirectly through the bank. And in selecting a bank assurance partner to fulfill this role, we've had to look for a couple of identifiers. The first among them is the underwriter's speed of response to customers. And the second is the financial strength and the capitalization base of the underwriter. In like fashion, with the strong interests of our customers in mind, Access Bank considered all of these qualities and found coronation insurance to be leading within the various categories. In fulfillment of more than a bank promise to you, we want our customers to have the best underwriting and claims experiences. You will notice the emphasis on claims experiences. And we believe that it is possible that with a bank assurance partnership in the company of coronation insurance, that those things will be achieved. Um, several, several insurance companies in the past have been sluggish or slow to meet the various claims. Uh, made by customers, even when they meet the very, very subtle lines of all of that. But I think coronation insurance will be shown to be totally, totally different. My partner, Aibuje Aigi Mokwede, recently retired as the chairman of Coronation Insurance's board of directors. 
He was succeeded by three chairpersons, but it is my privilege today to introduce Mr. Mathieu Simono, the chairman of the parent company, which is Coronation Insurance PLC. For those who are aware, Mutu was a corporate customer of Access Bank while he was CEO of Shell Africa. And during the period of working with him and interacting with him as his banking partner, I clearly recollect his strong emphasis on risk management and governance in his business operations. This is obviously evident in the way Shell has continued to exist and run his businesses up until today. I'd like to welcome Mutu to give his remarks around the bank assurance partnership between Access Bank and Coronation Insurance. Mutu, a very warm welcome to you. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you, Harvard. I'm really thrilled to be here speaking to people who used to be fellow chief executives in the corporate world, especially those in the industries in which I served. While at Shell, the business relationship of the organization with Access Bank was only beginning to thrive. This has since grown, expanding to several levels of service delivery partnerships with Access Bank, continuing to exceed our expectations in what we've come to expect of a banking partner. We are indeed very proud of Access Bank and also very proud of this partnership with Coronation Insurance. A few years after leaving Shell, I joined the board of Coronation Insurance, and I have been highly impressed by the few qualities of the organization. First is the digital maturity of the organization, and the size of investment the organization has made in scaling its digital maturity over the last decade. Second is the governance and financial capacity. And third is the talent stroke potentials within the organization. This is certainly not a surprise to me. It only reflects what you have come to expect from any organizations affiliated to IBJ and Harvard. What does this bank assurance partnership mean for you as a corporate customer of Access Bank? We believe this partnership between Access Bank and Coronation Insurance represents a key milestone for the Nigerian insurance industry. Through the coming together of both organizations, new standards of quality and service delivery will be established within the industry. Amongst others, the partnership will elevate the level at which insurance services are delivered to corporate customers in the country, matching the level of growth recorded in the banking sector over the last two decades, only over a shorter period. To officially present the partnership to you, we have set up this webinar session, bringing together a team of elite speakers with the main knowledge of corporate risk management. This is only a foretaste of the tailored high value propositions we have designed for the Bank Assurance Partnership. Ladies and gentlemen, do prepare yourself to be well informed, excited, and inspired. Before I hand over to Sion and Iyabo, our facilitators for today, I would like to say once more on behalf of Coronation Insurance PLC, welcome. It is wonderful to have you all here. Thank you. Each day comes with its share of opportunities and risks. That's why your insurance policy is there to protect you from sudden and unexpected events that might affect you or your business. But there are specific things or named perils that your insurance policy covers. All in a day's work. 
There are 17 named perils that are typically covered by insurance. Fire or lightning. Windstorms and hail. Smoke. Explosions. Rioters. Vehicles. Aircrafts. Vandalism. Theft. Falling objects. Accidental discharge or overflow of water or stream. Sudden and accidental tearing, cracking, burning or bulging. Freezing. Sudden and accidental damage due to short circuiting. Pandemic and disease outbreak. Digital and intellectual property theft. Flooding. With so many perils about, we could all probably do with a little help. And now that you know what your insurance covers, you don't have to face them alone. I thank Coronation Insurance and Access Bank for inviting me to speak this morning about the key macroeconomic risks and how they impact your business. I'd like to focus on the three key prices in the economy. The rate of inflation, interest rate, and exchange rate. The first one, and the most important out of the three, in my opinion, is the rate of inflation. The rate of inflation in Nigeria is currently around 12%, but the long-term rate is also around about that number. If we take a five-year average, a 10-year average, a 15-year average, or a 20-year average, we'll get around about the same number. So this means that the long-term rate of inflation in Nigeria is about 12%. What is inflation? You should think of inflation as the rate at which the Naira in your pocket loses purchasing power. For example, if we put 100 Naira in our pocket at the beginning of the year, by the end of the year, it will be able to buy only 12% less than what you used, uh, could buy at the beginning of the year. Therefore, we need to see the link between this and the exchange rate. The principal exchange rate that we all talk about is the rate between the Nigerian Naira and the US dollar. Why are we always talking about this? Because this is the principal currency of international trade, the United States dollars. What then is the long-term rate of inflation of the dollar? The long-term rate of inflation of the dollar is just under 2%. It means that the dollar loses 2% of its purchasing power every year, while the Naira loses about 12% of its purchasing power every year. So what, that, what does that tell us? It tells us that the Naira should devalue on average by that difference in inflation to keep purchasing power parity. So that is the principal reason why the Nigerian Naira is always devaluing against the dollar. And the Naira is the weaker of the two currencies. Indeed, any currency that has a rate of inflation that is significantly below our 12% is a stronger currency than the Naira. The important thing that I want you to note here is that we should not have net liabilities in dollars or any hard currencies. Because what tends to happen is that the Naira will devalue against the currency and we will need more and more Nigerian Naira to repay our debts. Therefore, we should keep our position at worst square. The next point I want to talk about is the interest rate. The most important interest rate in the environment is the rate at which the federal government of Nigeria borrows money. In fact, we refer to that as the risk-free rate in the environment. This is because, apart from taxing us, the federal government of Nigeria can print money to repay his debts, and that is legal. One would expect that the risk-free rate will at least cover the rate of annual inflation as well. Therefore, you would expect the risk-free rate for the one-year tenor to be maybe 12 percentage points plus a small premium. But in today's environment, we have a situation whereby the risk-free rate is significantly below the rate of inflation. One-year money is between 3 and 4% today, which means that anybody who saves 
and invest in federal government of Nigeria securities over a one-year period will actually lose purchasing power. And the amount of purchasing power they will lose is that 12% rate of inflation minus the 3 or 4% interest that they earn. So it is important for us to be very careful when we are managing our monetary assets. What are these monetary assets? Assets that are going to be repaid in fixed money terms, particularly those of us who, are, who have pension assets. The bulk of the pension assets are invested in government securities or other fixed income securities. Today, those assets are earning significantly below the rate of inflation. And if that continues for some considerable future period, it means that pension assets are going to be significantly eroded. That is the purchasing power of our pension assets. The next point I want to mention is about our tangible assets or our non-monetary assets. These are assets that typically would have a large import content as well. I'm talking about our plant and equipment that we use to manufacture our products. I'm talking about the motor vehicles that we have purchased and the trucks that we use in moving our goods around and even the factory buildings. These are non-monetary assets and in an inflationary environment, their values will tend to go up in nominal terms, in Naira terms. Therefore, when we're thinking of pricing our products, we should take the replacement cost of these assets into consideration when we are pricing our products so that we can generate sufficient cash flows to be able to replace those assets. When we are insuring these assets as well, it is important for us to take into account the replacement costs of those assets. And we should be thinking about insuring them at the depreciated replacement cost of the assets. So, I would like to summarize by looking at some key takeaways that I'd like to give you. The first one is that the Nigerian Naira is a weak currency because the rate of inflation on the Nigerian Naira is very high. Therefore, we should not be owing hard currencies, that is currencies that have a significantly lower rate of inflation like the United States dollars, the Great Britain pounds, the Euro, Japanese yen, even the renminbi of China. The second point I'd like you to take away is that when we are insuring our assets, we should take into account the depreciated replacement cost of the asset rather than the accounting historical cost less accumulated depreciation. Because if there is any peril down the road, we will not be able to recover sufficient sums of the money from the insurance company to be able to replace those assets. The next point I'd like to mention is that when we are managing our monetary assets, particularly our savings, our pension assets, it is important for us to strive to earn a return that is at least um, equal to the rate of inflation. But this is going to be extremely difficult in these climes because the risk-free rate itself is significantly below the rate of inflation and um, fixed income securities are priced using the risk-free rate plus a credit risk premium. So we see that uh, strong companies in Nigeria today are borrowing at 6-7% when the true rate should be much higher than that. The last point I'd like to mention is to talk about um, data security in our environment. We have a situation in the world of today where people are hacking into uh, people's computer systems to hijack information and data that are private to individuals and are private to businesses as well. And this is a high risk in our environment and we should make sure that we look for ways of managing these risks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bode, for that very informative session. I'm sure we're able to pick up a couple of things on ensuring our monetary and non-monetary um, assets and um, the importance of having this um, insured at depreciated value. So um, to take us on our next session, we have um, Nico, who is the MD of Monicly for Africa. So he'll be taking us on a session on um, managing cyber risk in 
your organization. Thank you. Good day again, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, warm greetings to you all. Um, I trust you are well and in good health in these exceptional times. I'm really honored by the invitation. Thank you very much for the opportunity. As you uh, know, cyber risk and its management is a complex and wide ranging topic. We could keep each other busy for many hours discussing this topic. I have only about 15 minutes and therefore please forgive me if I touch superficially on a few aspects only. What should keep CEOs lying awake at night? In our digital connected mobile world, cyber risk is deserving of some sleepless nights. Anything from the simple identity theft or something as trivial as my son's Facebook account getting hacked all the way to websites that are defaced or personal data that is stolen and companies held to ransom for the retrieval of this data. It is a wide range of topics that uh, encompasses from the trivial to the complex. Uh, cyber events are indeed increasing in frequency and in severity. If one looks back, it is clear to see that there have not been that many uh, incidents in the past, but that the frequency and severity of cybercrime incidents are increasing as we go along. And therefore, it is something that is also deserving increasing attention on our side. The next uh, question that we then should ask ourselves as people on the continent of Africa is, is Africa also exposed? Are we also at risk of cybercrime? And the answer is, uh, you bet. I am exposed and I believe so are you and your companies. I do online banking transactions. I uh, interact with my insurance company digitally. I have some personal information of mine kept by service providers. This makes me vulnerable to cybercrime and my company as well. So just to give an example, just last week, the South African judiciary was hacked. A few weeks earlier, a couple of well-known insurance brands in South Africa had to make embarrassing announcements about being hacked and their data being uh, exposed. This was, of course, not pleasant for their public relations department and proved that insurance companies and banks are not um, immune to, to such attacks. On the slide, if you can see it, there are also a few other examples examples of incidents that happened in South Africa and in other countries. The bottom line is, if we do business in Africa, we are exposed to cybercrime just as anywhere else in the world. So now that we have hopefully established that CEOs should lie awake about cybercrime, the next question you might ask me is, what should I do about that? And uh, if you could kindly move to the next slide, I'll appreciate that. This um, CEO of mine who is lying awake at night could do a couple of things about cyber risk. Firstly, the normal things that we do about all risks. We identify them, we quantify them, we monitor them, we try and mitigate them. I just want to stand for a moment on the topic of mitigation of cyber risk. Of course, the first thing that uh, any good corporate uh, company would do is to set up firewalls, antivirus programs, anti-phishing devices, all the IT technology that can be brought to bear to reduce cyber risk. Secondly, the company ought to also make sure that its employees, the employees themselves, are guardians against cybercrime. To make that practical, maybe a, an example from our company. Just about every week, I personally receive a, an email from our IT department, which looks like a phishing email. And it is up to me to identify that email and to report it correctly to the IT security desk of our company to prove to the company that I am alert and am a guardian against cybercrime in our organization. If I miss that email or I click on it illegally, I get uh, kindly invited to a refresher training about cybercrime. So please let's not underestimate the role that our frontline employees play 
in terms of mitigating cybercrime by being alert to social engineering, phishing and other events. But it is not possible to mitigate all cyber risk in our opinion. So there will always be some residual risk. And for that, it is important to also consider cyber insurance, in our opinion. The cyber insurance market, I show there some turnover numbers. The important message of my slide is just to convey that the cyber insurance market globally is a fast growing market. We believe, in fact, it could become one of the largest lines of business in the future. It is, of course, highly specialized and complex. One has to be very much aware of how cyber events unfold, what hackers get up to, and also guard carefully against accumulation of events taking place. If I just for a second dwell on that, uh, the, the scenario that any cyber insurer is concerned about is kind of the coronavirus analogy of cyber where one big event could impact all technology and computers or computer networks globally. That, of course, we would like to avoid also as a cyber insurer or reinsurer. Cyber insurance is not merely about paying money to an impacted policyholder. You know, when my computer is impacted by a virus and my data is wiped out, the last thing I need is a check from the insurance company. What I actually want is I want a new computer with my data restored, with, which is in full working mode again. Bear this analogy in mind, because that is really the service that a good cyber insurer or reinsurer provides to its policyholders. Uh, we try to uh, assist our policyholders, our clients, in the management of the overall cyber incident. That means dealing with public relations issues. It means dealing with legal cases. It means uh, cleaning out the virus or the cyber uh, uh, ransomware uh, that were installed illegally. It means reconstituting data. It means installing new protection software. It means bringing the company back to where it was before the event. It is a bit like providing a motor insurance policy plus uh, uh, a tow truck plus an ambulance plus a doctor to make sure that the client is in good shape after the incident. It is not just about paying a check to the, to the uh, person who was injured in the car accident. The role of uh, re the regulators are really, really important in cyber insurance. The more regulators put in place uh, specific regimes to manage data privacy and also to create uh, um, penalties in case data is uh, lost or stolen, the more people realize their exposures, can quantify their exposures, and realize that there is a need for cyber insurance. And therefore, we uh, track the development of uh, regulatory environments and uh, can see that as regulatory environments become more um, strict in terms of data protection, then also the need for cyber insurance to guard against cyber risks increases. It is not possible in a few minutes to do justice to the topic of cyber insurance. I trust in these few minutes, I have given you a few pieces of food for thought in terms of how to manage cyber risk. And I would look forward to engaging with you in the question and answer session in more detail. If you would like to discuss with Munich Re in more detail, of course, we are also at your disposal. In closing, I trust, I trust that none, none of you will really have sleepless nights about cyber risk, but that you and your insurers and reinsurers will help to mitigate and manage these risks. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nico, for that educative and enlightening piece. It's great to know that cyber-related risk can be effectively mitigated and managed. Um, I would therefore like to call upon our third keynote speaker for the day, Simon Norris. Simon is a partner with the leading British law firm Trinity. He will deliver a presentation on project completion risks, ensuring that we can mitigate such risks that are in project development in a highly volatile foreign exchange uh, market.
Yabo, that's very kind. And thank you to Access Bank and Coronation Insurance for inviting me to speak today. Like Nico, my topic is uh, is rather huge, so I'm going to try to run through it at a relative pace, but please use the Q&A function to, to stop me at any time. I'm a, I'm a partner at Trinity International. We are a law firm focused almost entirely on transactions on the African continent. I advised and have advised across about 50 countries uh, within Africa. I've done a number of transactions in Nigeria, including by way of example, um, and if you go to the next slide, you can see my introduction. By way of example, I advised on the Azura Edo 450 megawatt power plant that a number of you I'm sure will be will be familiar with. I act for banks, both commercial and development finance institutions. I also act for developers and investors and occasionally the public sector. Most of my client base is international, so what a, a lot of what I'll be speaking about is from that international perspective, but that's certainly not exclusive. I also act for an, a number of uh, of uh, investors in, in the Nigerian context as well. So what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to talk you through um, it and I'm going to use effectively, uh, I won't use Azure as the actual example, but I, I'm thinking about in the context of a large scale project, typically an infrastructure project, it might be power, it might be a road project, it might be a rail project, it might be a port project, but I'm hoping that a lot of the, the risks that I'm going to highlight, and, and they go beyond Forex, but a lot of these risks that I'm going to highlight are, are common across a, a number of businesses, but conscious that I'm going to talk to you from a power and infrastructure perspective mainly. So the first point I've made, which I think is a point that Nico made as well, you, you can't remove the risk. So actually what I'm going to be talking about is how you mitigate that risk or how you share that risk with others. So we, we have a phrase in, in project finance that you should, that the party that is best able to bear the risk is the party that should take that risk. Now that's something that we keep in the back of our mind throughout the life of a project. Now here I'm, I'm gonna talk initially to the beginning of a transaction, the beginning of the project that you might be contemplating, thinking about some of the risks that we think about and our clients think about when it comes to structuring the investment. Now what are the things we are concerned about? We're concerned about making sure that the money we invest in is money that we can also get out. So we need to make sure that in, in structuring the investment, certainly from an international perspective, we think about bilateral investment treaties. We think about from an international perspective, where do we set up our holding company? Does Nigeria have bilateral investment treaties and, and double taxation agreements to make sure that we get the best tax treatment from our investors and from our money? probably more important than that, more important than anything else, frankly, is making sure that we are partnering with robust, strong Nigerian co-investors, people who genuinely understand the environment into which we are we are putting our money and will partner and make sure that we we develop our project in 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 the right way. And when we think about how we put that money in, one of the issues we are concerned about is, as I said earlier, how does that money come out? So how do we structure the equity? Do we simply use ordinary shares or do we think about shareholder loans? Do we think about preference shares, all these other structures that we could employ? Well, regardless of the nature of the equity, we always need to make sure that we are doing things in line with regulation. So in the context of Nigeria, making sure that we have our certificates of capital importation, our CCIs in line and that regime working properly with our partner bank is absolutely essential. Another question we think about when, when we look at the overall risk of the investment that we might be making, who can we share some of these risks with? Do we, do we want to share this entirely as a group of equity investors or do we want to bring on lenders who can help share that risk by allowing our equity to be leveraged? And certainly when I'm talking about large scale infrastructure projects, 99 times out of 100, we are structuring debt and we're structuring it on a limited recourse basis, which means that the equity providers, although they appreciate there is risk, they are to some extent being insulated from that risk because they're putting their money into a limited liability company that defines the, the, the parameters of that risk. And they're sharing a lot of the risk or a lot of the cost of the risk uh, with their lender group. So that, that's an important thing to be thinking about at the beginning of a transaction and then structuring into the documentation. We also concern ourselves with regulatory risk. You know, we, we are worried what happens if the environment into which we have invested changes. So change in law is a, is a classic issue, I think, that keeps not just CEOs up at night, but their advisors and, and their employees. 
Now, if we're thinking about something like the Azura project, we have a robust agreement with the Nigerian government called the put call option agreement, and that provides certain protections should a change in law happen. It means that if there are increases in costs or there are delays or drops in revenue that they're experienced, we can, to a certain extent, be shielded from those under the terms of that agreement and, and effectively receive compensation and or extensions of time to keep us whole. So that's important. I should say here, though, that when I talk about regulatory risk and when I talk about change in law, I think the perception is often that this is this is something that, that is unique to Africa or unique to markets that are developing. And, and in my experience, that is quite the opposite. Where I've seen change in law come into fruition has actually been in Western Europe. So if we look at renewable technology as an example, the British government, the Italian government, the French government, the Spanish government, the German government have all decided to change the law effectively overnight and remove feed-in tariffs from the marketplace. So this concept that change in law is something that uh, is unique to uh, or prevalent on the African continent is a, is a false one. Now, this is where insurance can begin to play a, a role. So back to the previous slide, please. So I, I'm, I'm going to talk briefly about political risk insurance, PRI, as we often we use that we use that initialism. So political risk insurance, which is available to both equity investors and debt investors, can be used to protect those investors against some of those perceived political risks that might occur in any transaction. I'll talk to some of them in a little more detail, but one of the core um, coverages that is available here is breach of contract. So as lawyers, we make sure that our companies are engaging in robust contracts with all counterparties to try to uh, mitigate the risk that we can perceive. But to the extent there is then a breach under one of those contracts, such as the put call option agreement that I referred to a moment ago, on the occurrence of that breach, we can start a process under our political risk insurance and we can ask that insurer eventually once we get through arbitration we can ask them to pay out and therefore return capital to the equity investors or the debt investors so as an example of insurance playing a, a very key practical mitigant in these complex structures and that pri can come from the private market uh, and it can also come from the public market so we're used to dealing with the, the likes of mega as an example in, in public market there are other risk enhancement tools outside of contracts that we use um, the credit enhancement, such as the partial risk guarantee, which is which is a product that is made available by various institutions globally. The World Bank Group, probably the most well known, I would argue, and the partial risk guarantee was employed, has been employed in a number of uh, transactions in, in the Nigerian context, which again means that should certain risks happen, there is a potential to be paid and kept whole, both in terms of equity and in terms of debt, by here, in my example, the World Bank Group, which means you're effectively no longer taking the project risk, but you're now taking the risk that the World Bank Group will pay you out. You're taking effectively AAA rated US risk, which obviously enhances or mitigates the underlying project risk. And the last point is a very practical point. So we expect regulatory risk to happen. We expect changes in law to happen because, because governments have the discretion to do that. And that is only right that they do. But when it happens, our companies, our clients very often get together as an industry lobby group and talk to the government directly with the support of their lenders very often. And if our lenders include development finance institutions, the likes of the African Development Bank, the likes of Africa Finance Corporation in Lagos, for instance, then that lobby can be powerful and can speak to government to, to try to lobby for positive change or, or to, to put a risk back where it should have been. I'm, I'm going to talk quite a bit here to, to Forex because I, I think in, in today's Nigeria, um, I'm sure a, a number of you will agree, the availability of foreign currency, the pricing of the US dollar against the Naira and the ability to transfer currency outside of Nigeria is at, a, is at a difficult moment in Nigeria's history at the moment. I'm glad to say things have been improving over the last few weeks, but certainly in the months before that, as with the oil price being where it is in particular, we've seen real challenges. So, so if I'm investing US dollars into Nigeria, definitely one of the aspects that keeps me awake at night, keeps my clients awake at night is, how do I convert my Naira receipts, my Naira dividends, my Naira revenue back into dollars? And how do I then take that back to my shareholders or pay my international lenders? 
So the first practical thing that we would always try to do in any transaction is try to maximize the amount of Niro denominated costs. Now that, that might simply be assets or services that, that the project is purchasing. For instance, with the construction contract, which I will speak to you later, do we have a local EPC or construction contractor who will charge in Naira? And, with, and, and if so, then we are removing, to a certain extent, some of the, the Forex exposure. So in Azura, as a good example, we had Julius Berger as, as one, of our, one of our contractors, so a, a fantastic uh, Nigerian contractor at the table. I talked about political risk earlier, and political risk has a role to play here as well. So there are two covers, or one cover rather, of PRI that has two prongs to it that relates to Forex. If you are unable to convert your Naira into, into US dollars, into, into pounds, into euros, then the PRI can respond to that. So that is an insurable event. So depending on, on what causes the inconvertibility, but then you have the ability to take your Naira and to effectively give your Naira to the insurer in return for which the insurer gives you dollars and the insurer goes into the market to try to recoup, uh, recoup the loss to reclaim those dollars. And equally, if there are restrictions around transferring the Naira or those restrictions become worse and you can no longer transfer the Naira offshore, again, the PRI insurance can respond to that risk and allow you to expatriate your now converted Forex and, and take it to, to wherever your shareholders or lenders might be. The central bank has a role to play here, or at least it does in the large scale infrastructure projects where lenders, in particular international lenders, like to use as a mitigant, they like to use offshore accounts so that there is a reserve of foreign currency sitting in an, in, in a, in an offshore account that is sitting there ready to pay debt service. Now, typically under the rules of the central bank, that is not possible. So you need to go and talk to the central bank and effectively lobby for the ability to reserve these monies offshore. In my experience, the central bank is very open to these sorts of conversations uh, and, it, and is willing for, for the, the right investment to give certain exemptions from the central bank regulations to allow this reserving to happen and therefore to help you mitigate some of the forex risk. And, and hedging products, of course, you know, not depending on the nature of the asset, the, the nature of your revenue stream, but it is it is very likely that you can use hedging products. And certainly a number of our clients in the Nigerian environment are currently employing currency hedging products to try to insulate themselves to a certain extent against the drop in value uh, of the Naira against the dollar. Counterparty risk is a slightly odd one. It's another sort of pervasive risk, if you will. It's that it's the perception that there is a risk that your counterparty with whom you are dealing is not going to perform or might cause a breach or, or simply might not be the counterparty that you expect them to be. So, so how, practically speaking, how do we manage this risk? Well, we do our due diligence, or at least we assist our clients in doing in doing our due diligence to make sure that each of the counterparties that we are that we are getting into a contractual relationship with have the track record we expect them to have and can do the job that we want them to do. They are the right partners. From a legal perspective, we would always encourage our clients to make sure that they are entering into robust contracts right at the beginning of a transaction. So I've got a shameless advert on the right hand side of each of these slides saying from a legal perspective, this is all about drafting contracts and negotiating contracts so they are robust and they are clear and they give the protection and the mitigant to to our client, uh, to you. So whether that is a share purchase agreement to the extent you're acquiring an interest in, in an entity, whether that's some kind of joint development agreement, which is an unincorporated joint venture between two or more parties carrying out one of these projects. Perhaps it's a shareholders agreement where each party has purchased equity in a, in a vehicle. Make sure that those documents are clear and that they that they contemplate the types of risks that we've been talking about and not just contemplate them, but detail what happens should these risks actually occur. And finally, on the insurance side, certainly in the context of a sale or a purchase, we see warranty insurance being quite a common tool that, that our clients use when they are acquiring assets to effectively insure against the package of representations and warranties that the seller is giving in respect of the asset or the company that's being purchased. So it's so a warranty insurance. Certainly my experience is becoming more and more common on the transactions that I work on and, and it's a neat mitigant. So on this slide, I've sort of morphed now away from these pervasive risks that we think about at the beginning of a, of, a, of a project, and I'm moving more towards the completion risk, if you will. So construction, 
you're going to construct whatever this thing might be. I've used the example of a power project. This could be road, this could be rail, this could be port. Frankly, this could be anything. It could be a factory. How do you manage the risk of construction? And what is that risk? So I think we summarize the risk of construction in terms of, is the thing going to be built to time? Is it going to be built to meet the specification or the output requirements that we have? And is it going to be built to budget or are we going to be exposed to cost overruns? So how do we mitigate these risks? First and foremost, we make sure that our counterparty who's carrying out this construction is a, an experienced contractor with a great track record. And as I mentioned earlier, earlier Junius Berger is part of the, the Siemens consortium on the Azura deal to help manage some of the logistical challenges. Bringing goods through the Nigerian ports can be challenging, for instance, um, you know, delays can happen through customs, etc. So having a very experienced contractor by your side to manage these risks is absolutely essential. And to have that contractor or contractors enter into what we would call an EPC contract in project finance, engineering, procurement and construction, where all of the risks associated with the with the construction of the asset or the vast majority of the risks at least are pushed over to this contractor or contractor. So you've got a single person who is responsible or a single group of people who are responsible to deliver that asset to time and to budget and to meet your specifications or your output. And if that doesn't happen, you've got robust protection under that document. Ultimately, you can reject the asset and say, I don't want this, have my money back and start from scratch. So ultimately you're hopefully shielded from, from that construction risk. Managing the contractor is also important. So taking on an experienced team of engineers who are used to overseeing and managing complex projects to oversee the contractor or contractors is also a, a big part of the mitigant here. And finally, and, and, and in some ways, probably most importantly, there's insurance that is available to cover off virtually all of the risk that we associate with the construction phase. Probably key is construction all risks, albeit that's obviously an umbrella term that covers various underlying risks. Perhaps the most important of which is is the delay in startup. So if you're if you're looking to complete your project in order to get to a point at which you're starting to generate revenue and there's a delay, what happens? Well, some of that risk can be pushed to the contractor, but if it's a risk the contractor doesn't take and insurable risk occurs, then delay in startup insurance responds to that risk and helps keep the equity whole, helps to pay the cost that the equity is having and, and to a certain extent can start to pay um, the, the profits that they are expecting to see. And in the context of a financed transaction can also be covering the cost of the lenders, the interest that is accruing during construction. So it, it's a very powerful tool. We also think about things, um, what happens when you buy an asset, you buy a large turbine from, from Asia and the turbine drops off the side of a ship. You know, again, insurance can cover these sorts of risks uh, in a, expect the unexpected. And, and in fact, on an East African project I was working on relatively recently, that's exactly what happened. Very, very large turbines dropped off the edge of the ship in the middle of the ocean. Luckily, the insurance responded and, and pretty much covered the risks of both equity and lenders so we could move on. So on this next slide, this is this is the last part of a, of a project, if you will. So you, you've got to a degree of completion here because you, you've delivered the physical asset and the physical asset is starting to generate revenue, but but your risk is not ended. And so completion is an odd phrase in the context of a project finance asset because it sort of comes in parts. The key point is certainly as construction ends, let's say, and revenue starts, but operations also is a, is a period in which a phase in which we see risk and risk that we need to think about how to manage. So I've, I've talked very generally here about operational risk and I've said expect the unexpected, which which is absolutely true. So, so, so when the unexpected happens, how do you defend yourself against that risk? Well, I go back to the robust contracts I was talking about earlier in those contracts with our various counterparties and in the in, in the context of a large scale power project. One of those key counterparties will be the likes of NBET, the off taker and the federal government. So should certain things outside of your control, surprises happen, force majeure, as we tend to say in the legal world, should these things happen, there is protection under those documents particularly if those risks have a quasi-political flavour to them, then we expect compensation to flow towards the, the equity investors. 
but also insurance can respond to this. So if we are talking about natural risks that occur, acts of God, if you will, then those are generally speaking all insurable. And then similar to the analysis in the construction phase, we have property or risk insurance. Part of that is business interruption. So should one of these insurable events happen and stop the asset performing and generating revenue, then that insurance responds and pays the equity and can also keep the lenders whole, can help you pay debt service, which is important. And also the PRI that I talked to earlier, the, the political risk insurance is not just limited to the construction phase, but also can carry on through the operational life of the asset. And again, should some of those political risks occur, expropriation of, uh, of shares, for instance, as I talked about earlier, Forex in convertibility is another risk we're concerned about. That PRI can, to a certain extent, help respond to those those issues and pay pay monies back towards back towards the equity and the debt investors. So the last point I want to talk about, which which is which is pervasive really, although I put it right at the end, is investment exit. So you, you've made a large investment or you even you are planning to make a large investment. As I said earlier, you're, you're always thinking in the structure in the structuring as to how you effectively and efficiently put your money into that investment. But how is your money going to come back to you? Now, we, we've talked about Forex challenges. We've talked about capital flight restrictions. But in the in the, in a in, in hopefully most examples there will be a point at which the as the asset reaches um, a, a value that you're happy with and you want to sell that asset to someone else or a part of that asset or that company to someone else so we would always say to our clients think about this at the beginning and put into your documents the right for you to sell the right for you to list your assets and make sure that you get the relevant counterparties consent to this if you can so you don't want to find yourself in a position where someone has approached you to purchase the asset or the business or you or you found a you found a purchaser and then you realize that a number of the counterparts with whom you are contracting must give their consent to that and that would in the context of a power project for instance such as azura include getting consent from the regulator getting consent from the offtaker getting consent from the government getting consent from the lenders getting consent from your fellow shareholders if it's just one entity selling out. So again, it comes back to robust contractual protection where you're thinking about these risks up front and documenting them. So when they happen, hopefully you don't then need to go back for consent. It's already been granted to you. My final thoughts, I'm afraid, is sort of bad news to end on. Perhaps it's the, perhaps the wrong place to put this, but the asset doesn't always go as well as you want it to. You know, asset value drops or the performance of the asset is not what you're expecting or the company doesn't doesn't perform as well as you want it to. Within project finance projects that I've been talking to, we would again expect the swathe of contracts to deal with that. So termination happens, compensation comes back to the investors and the lenders to keep them whole and meaning that you've achieved an exit. It might not be at full value, but at least you've mitigated some of that termination risk that you were concerned about. And that's all I have to say. So if you've, if you've got questions, please use the Q&A function. My contact details are there. Please feel free to, to drop me an email. Thank you very much. We have a couple of questions here, which we'll take um, quite quickly. Um, I think the first one actually goes to Simon. It's a um, Forex um, related topic. So um, Simon, would um, love you to please speak to this. It says the risk of Forex availability is very high in Nigeria today. How do we address this risk when FX liquidity is very low and companies need to import raw materials and equipment? Uh, so Simon, could you please um, help speak to this? I think what you're asking me is around forex avail availability and how do we address address that risk when liquidity is low and companies need to import raw materials equipment etc that are that are priced in dollars i mean in in the context of the sorts of deals that, that i do which as i was saying earlier tend to be in the in the power and infrastructure space although also also in oil and gas and natural resources telecoms etc but very often the clients that that I'm working with um, employ or or use um, foreign debt. So the, the the main problem for them comes almost as a result of using 
dollar denominated debt. So in order to purchase dollar denominated assets, those entities, that project company can can take on dollar denominated debt and therefore it's got dollars available to make these purchases. But in some ways that's delaying the pain because it then means that the company has got dollar denominated debt obligations owing to the lenders. <clears throat> and as, as I was saying earlier, one of one of the ways in which we we try to deal with that risk is to use offshore accounts in which you can take the dollars that you do have and you can reserve them so you're not constantly taking the naira to dollar exchange rate risk and the risk frankly that there's that there are naira sorry that there are dollars available in the marketplace so that's one, that's one of the protections and and also as i mentioned earlier Political risk insurance can can respond to this if you are an international investor. So it can respond to the inability to convert and the inability to transfer. What it can't respond to is, is, is just a, a change in the current in the exchange rate. So a lack of availability it can certainly help you with. But if it's an exposure of the Naira against the dollar, I'm afraid PRI won't respond. Uh, and one of the shortcomings, sadly, of the PRI products in the market is they only are available to international investors. So if you're a domestic investor, I'm afraid PRI is not something that can come to your can come to your assistance. But for international investors, it's um, it, it's certainly one of the tools that's available. Thanks, um, Simon, for that um, explicit um, response to the question that we received. So we have um, another question here from one of our speakers to Nico. So how do you protect against data exposure in a climate where it's difficult to hold your employees accountable? So I guess this uh, refers to um, data protection policies within organizations with respect to the employees. Uh, Nico? If uh, colleagues in the staff, uh, so staff members in a company work with data that ought to be protected and they are not held accountable, um, frankly speaking, I would be um, thinking that that company ought to take stronger measures to create the right culture of accountability, of awareness of the risks, and put in place uh, also very importantly uh, training and development uh, mechanisms to, to enhance that uh, accountability. Because without that first line of defense working properly, I think anything else is bound to fail. It's um, I would suggest quite a dangerous position for a company to be in with uh, with due respect to the to the question uh, to the question uh, to the person who posed the question. I hope that helps. Absolutely, um, Nico. That does answer the question. So there's a final question here, but I think this is more this is directed more internally to Coalition Insurance and Access Bank. So it says given the developing trend in cyber crime. And Nigerian insurance companies in the position to provide cyber insurance in manner described by Nico, that is partnering to restore victims to play attack situations rather than simply writing checks. So I'm um, um, glad to inform us that, um, which is why we also have Nico on the call today. Um, Coalition Insurance is structuring some partnerships with Monically, amongst many other leading um, organizations along across the globe. And um, we'll be coming up with um, a few propositions that would help, to help address this, just like um, Nico spoke about during his presentation. So to shed a bit more light on that, uh, my colleague will be speaking in the next session. We would have um, Peggy Ongu. Peggy is um, one of our directors here in Coalition Insurance. She leads our corporate sales team. And she'll be giving us an overview of the propositions that are available now She'll speak to a number of our value propositions for you, our customers, uh, and um, what we have in plan for you over the next financial year. So over to you, Peggy. Thank you, Sheo. I will add by saying we will work with you to understand your needs. Our corporate portal, our relationship managers and brokers combine seamless to seamlessly to enable you manage your policies effectively. From identification of perils to delivering ultimately the relevant policy. Our engagement framework supports proactive communication with the organization at every point in your journey of gathering information of your valued assets 
identifying perils and mitigating them. We will engage with you for an insurance audit process. We will generate a report providing a hazard control recommendation. We will work with you in drafting an insurance risk policy. We will provide you a bespoke proposal aimed at minimizing the risk in a cost-effective manner. You may get to know more about our products. Shenyo referred to the partnership we'll have, we're having with Munich Re. We will, you'll get to know more about our products through our digital pitch book, our podcasts, and our web page. We know that timely settlement of your claims is key, and this can be handled end-to-end -end through our corporate portal. We will continue to offer value to you, our clients, through webinars such as this, and ongoing coaching for your teams, including your drivers, machine operators, all aimed at reducing the possible hazards. Why coronation insurance? Our unique operating model, our best in class capabilities and technology, all aim to ensure we serve you in an efficient manner. Our portfolio enables us to deliver value to you, our customer, beyond policy underwriting and claims payment within 48 hours. Our digitally enabled operating model also enables swift data informed decisions. Our core insurance application, WAPEX, is robust, functional, and enables efficient integration with complementary systems for optimal service delivery. Our overarching goal is to make you be rested at the end of your workday whilst looking forward to a new day of opportunities. I would like to welcome the Managing Director of Coordination Insurance to give the vote of thanks. Over to you, Yinka. We hope the webinar has been impactful and will help you in planning your 2021 budgeting session. I would like to conclude this session by thanking all the attendees and participants. Thank you for honoring the invitation and thank you for staying to the end of the session.